Some new and unfamiliar equipment is appearing on the track. By now, most of us know that it's to do with automatic train protection, ATP. So what is ATP? How does it work? And more importantly, how does it affect us? During 150 years of development, railway signalling has sought the perfection of total fail-safe reliability. From early days, the operation of points and signals were mechanically interlocked to prevent signalmen setting up conflicting movements in error. Later, electrical locking was introduced to ensure that signals could not be cleared while the section ahead was occupied. Finally, the adaptation of the simple track circuit to become an integral part of the signal control operation resulted in the modern multiple aspect track circuit block. However, as the whole purpose of the signalling system is to regulate and control the movement of trains, total fail-safe reliability cannot be achieved unless the system is able, in the final resort, to physically retard or stop a moving train. And that's exactly where automatic train protection comes in. Put quite simply, ATP transmits information to the train, and this information is used to supervise the safe running of the train, ensuring, for example, that all speed restrictions are observed and that danger signals are not passed without authority. Automatic train protection is being introduced in two pilot schemes, one on the Great Western Main Line and the other on the Chiltern Line. Each of these schemes uses equipment supplied by a different manufacturer so that, although they work in exactly the same way, there are considerable differences in the track installations. We'll be looking at these later. Let's begin by looking at how ATP works. Each locomotive or power car is fitted with an onboard computer into which is fed all the data concerning the train braking and performance characteristics. Data is also fed to the onboard computer from the track via a receiver mounted on one of the bogey frames. This track data is transmitted to the train by beacons and cable loops on the Great Western Main Line and by cable loops on the Chiltern line. The track data generated by electronics located in the adjacent cabinets consists of fixed information such as gradients, line speed and permanent speed restrictions and changing information such as signalling data. Additionally, plugs or cards may be inserted to provide additional information such as temporary or emergency speed restrictions. In the driving cab, the integration of track data and train data provides the driver with all the information necessary to run the train safely and properly within all safety margins. Where an ATP fitted train is unable to receive full track data, and this includes of course signalling, the onboard computer will return to partial supervision and the safety benefits of ATP will be largely lost. If a beacon or loop is removed or damaged, a brake application will be provoked as soon as a train reaches the position of the missing or damaged installation. Now that we've looked at the function of ATP, it's time to take a look at the track installations, the bits that concern us in our everyday work. Let's start with the GWML. Track data is transmitted to the train by beacons normally situated on the immediate approach to each signal. Additionally, at some locations, cable loops are installed in the rear of beacons to provide infill data. 
The beacons and loops are installed in the forefoot, but, unlike AWS magnets, are offset to the left in the normal direction of running. This simple arrangement permits the ATP system to detect the direction of movement. Beside each beacon is an electronics housing containing the plugs which generate the track data. The principal difference to be found in the Chilton ATP installation is that the track data is transmitted exclusively by cable loops. These are also handed for direction of running. The distinctive electronics housing, known as a yellow mushroom, contains cards which generate track data. So much for how ATP actually works, but how does it affect those of us who have to work on the track? How do we go about living with ATP? The track installation has been designed so that day-to-day -day maintenance can be carried out without affecting the working of ATP, or incurring any excessive additional work. For example, the cable loop is attached to the foot of the left-hand rail with simple spring clips, easy to remove and replace. The centre of the loop cable is attached to the sleeper top by the equally simple means of a plastic cable tie. So let's look at some examples of track work which we can carry out without disturbing the ATP installation at all. Tamping and lining machines can operate over beacon and cable loops. The tamping tines and roller rail lifting clamps will not interfere with the ATP installation, providing track movement is limited to a maximum of 25 millimeters. Where we need to open out cribs for wet spot treatment, or to pack by hand, this work can also be done without disturbing the ATP installation. However, take care not to damage the cable, particularly in the centre of the forefoot. Permanent way staff can change fastenings and accompanying insulations without disturbing the loop cable. Where cable fixings occur in close proximity to the fastening which needs changing, these can be temporarily removed so as to obtain slack in the cable. Replace the cable fixing after careful insertion of the new fastening or component. Again, take care not to trap or pinch the loop cable. Where a sleeper needs to be replaced or repositioned, we'll be undoing fastenings and digging out ballast. As we've already seen, both these tasks can be carried out without disturbing the loop cable. But if a sleeper on which a beacon is mounted needs changing, then obviously the S&T must be advised and an S&T technician in attendance when the work is carried out. The need to replenish ballast is an important maintenance function and the presence of ATP installations must not prevent the provision of an adequate ballast profile. Wherever possible, we must arrange to satisfy this need by unloading ballast onto sleeper ends and shoulders, avoiding the forefoot where ATP beacons or cable loops may be situated. This may not always be possible, so we'll come back to this problem. For obvious reasons, regulator machines shouldn't be used to plough ballast in ATP-fitted areas. Where necessary, final profiling and clearance of ballast off sleeper ends will have to be carried out manually. When rails are unloaded in the forefoot, Careful placing of the rails on each side of the beacon and central cable will suffice to protect the installation. Care must be taken, however, not to crush the loop cable at any point, 
especially when the ends of long welded rail are landed. Rail grinding in the vicinity of ATP installations must be carried out with the portable rail grinder. Up to the present time, no conclusive tests have been carried out with the rail grinding train on ATP fitted track. However, experience has shown that cables have been damaged by this train in the past. So when in doubt, don't. Now we come to some maintenance and renewal jobs where partial removal of the ATP installation will be required. Where we need to change a number of sleepers, the cable loop will have to be unfastened and temporarily displaced. P-Way staff can still do this quite simply, as well as replacing and refastening the cable when the work is completed. Don't forget that you'll need a supply of the plastic cable ties. The changing of any sleeper which actually supports a beacon must be supervised by s and staff. These sleepers can be supplied pre-drilled. Where we have to remove a defective rail, the loop cable fixed to the rail can be unfastened over a length just sufficient to enable the cable to be moved into the forefoot, clear of the thermit weld positions. The welding staff can carry out this displacement of the loop cable prior to the work, but the cable must not be replaced until all thermit welds have cooled for a period of three hours. In this case, replacement of the cable will have to be carried out by s and staff. The ATP system will, of course, still function during the cooling period. Maintenance welding of the railhead will also require displacement of the loop cable over a short length. Move it away from the rail into the forefoot. When the work is completed, you can reattach the loop cable to the foot of the rail in the normal way. Where loop cables are situated across switches and crossings, the cable is diverted outside the forefoot so it won't directly interfere with the changing of components or build-up welding of the crossing piece. We must, however, still take great care to see that the loop cable is not crushed or burned in the vicinity of the work. Pre-stressing of continuous welded rail may well cover the entire length of a loop cable and will require detachment of the cable from the rail throughout. This can be done immediately prior to commencement of the work in cooperation with s and staff. Again, thermit welding is involved, so the refixing of the cable to the rail must not be carried out until after the weld positions have properly cooled. There will be occasions, particularly where lifting is to take place, when ballast may have to be unloaded into the forefoot. This may take place prior to the actual lifting date, if only to be sure of getting the ballast. That's, uh, this, this is where the job is. Proper planning of the work is, therefore, essential. The precise location of the work must be discussed with the S&T department in accordance with laid down planning procedures and agreement reached as to how the work will be done and its effect on the ATP installation. Where rails have to be traversed on the top surface of sleepers, Special care will need to be taken to avoid damage to beacons or loop cable. Once again, by prior consultation at the planning stage, the temporary displacement of beacon or loop cable can be arranged. Should any beacon or cable loop get damaged in the course of work, or should P-Way staff observe damage from other causes, the signal fault control must be immediately advised. So far, we've looked at work which can be done without disturbing the ATP installation. And we've also looked at work which will only require temporary displacement of the loop cable. Now we need to look at much bigger jobs which require complete removal. Complete track renewal. Total resleepering.
ballast cleaning and blanketing. And major lifting or realignment, whether by machine or manually, where track movement will exceed 25 millimeters. In all these cases, close cooperation between the S&T and civil engineering departments will be required. The removal, as well as subsequent reinstatement of the ATP installation, will be an integral part of the work plan. On the GWML, it will be important to give exact location of beacons, since even when the beacon itself has been removed, the base plate remains bolted to the sleepers. Once these base plates have been covered by fresh ballast, there will always be a danger of damage to the now hidden installation. Precise times of disconnection and reinstatement of ATP will have to be agreed beforehand and be published in the weekly operating notice. Now that we've looked at the different categories of work and their impact on the ATP installation, it's time to consider the vital business of proper planning. The first principle of the planning process is the establishment of good liaison between the parties involved, the civil engineers, the signal engineers, and the operators. The civil engineering and S&T departments have agreed procedures and details of these are available from your local manager. Let's look at some examples of key planning issues that will affect our work. For a start, the civil engineers must indicate whether and to what extent ATP installations are affected in all renewal proposals. Possession planning on the GWML must include provision for the removal and reinstatement of all affected beacons. Because the cable loops provide only infill data, it may be possible to undertake removal and subsequent reinstatement outside the main possession time. But this will need the agreement of the signalling and operations people. When this is being planned, the necessary timescales must be identified as well as protection arrangements. On the Chilton lines, the cable loops are the sole means of data transmission so removal and reinstatement must be included within the civil engineer's possession and the necessary timescales allowed for when planning the possession. Before attending the possession meeting, it is essential that local representatives from both the civil engineers and the S&T hold joint site meetings to agree the precise details of how the work will be carried out. At this stage, there are some important considerations affecting ATP installations. Loops can only be reinstated once the ballast level has been reduced to top of sleeper level, so civil engineers must identify at what stage this will be achieved. Sleepers to which beacons will be attached need pre-drilling, so where relaying or re-sleepering is planned, the requirement for pre-drilled sleepers must be identified. As we've already seen, the removal and reinstatement of short lengths of unbroken loop can be carried out by civil engineering staff. However, precise details must be included in the planning notices and S&T staff must audit the work. Again, we've already seen that tamping should not affect ATP installations. If, however, there is cross-track ATP cabling at the site, full details of the tamping program must be submitted to the local S&T manager. The unloading of maintenance ballast should be pre-planned. The covering of loops by ballast might be acceptable, but the S&T will not automatically agree to this. Where possible, every effort should be made to arrange removal and reinstatement of loops in connection with ballast drops and associated work. In any event, ballast should not be left above sleeper height for longer than is absolutely necessary. Normally, maintenance ballast should be dropped on sleeper ends. Emergency work may require the partial removal and subsequent reinstatement of loops. In this case, authority must be obtained 
from the responsible signal maintenance engineer. Once the emergency work is completed, s and staff must confirm satisfactory reinstatement where any work requires the total removal of loops. The operations manager must first agree the extent and timing of the ATP disconnection. Because the ATP system supervises temporary and emergency speed restrictions, there are some new considerations for engineering staff. A series of flowcharts has been published to guide you through the new procedures for ATP fitted lines. These flowcharts cover both temporary and emergency arrangements. Let's begin with temporary speed restrictions. In addition to the existing arrangements for the implementation of a TSR, the s and technician will install the ATP plugs or cards at each of the signals on the approach to the site, beginning with the outermost signal. These TSR plugs or cards will generate the data for transmission to the train so that ATP can supervise to the appropriate speed. Once the TSR plug or card has been installed at each signal, the s and technician will first test the transmission of the new data using the portable data test equipment. The small screen will give a readout of all data being transmitted including the newly imposed TSR. Once this has been done, the permanent waste section manager and the s and technician must jointly sign the form ATP-1. Once ATP supervision of the TSR warning is active, the s and technician must also advise the controlling signaling centre. When it becomes necessary to impose an emergency speed restriction in an ATP fitted area, the s and fault technician will insert a plug or card at each of the signals protecting the site, beginning with the outermost. These plugs or cards allow the system to give the driver advice of an approaching ESR. It will not tell the driver the actual speed of the ESR, nor supervise the train to that speed, so the civil engineer will provide and position speed restriction boards in the normal way. Until these two tasks are completed, hand signalmen will stop and caution all trains. If an ESR is to remain in force for a significant time, the s and will provide and fit the necessary plugs or cards so that trains will be actually supervised to a precise target speed. Finally, when a temporary speed restriction is to be removed in accordance with the published weekly operating notice, the civil engineer must advise the signal engineer to that effect. The P-Way section manager arranges the removal of the TSR boards, while the s and technician removes the plugs or cards from the protecting signals, beginning with the innermost. Once all TSR plugs and cards have been removed, and TSR boards taken down, both the s and technician and the P-Way section manager must jointly sign the form ATP2. The s and technician will then advise the signalling centre and trains will again run normally under full ATP supervision. Now let's look at some important safety issues. It's vitally important to remember that trains will run whether ATP is fully operational or not. Where any disconnection of a beacon or cable loop is called for, or even temporary displacement of the cable, the work must be carried out in a manner which ensures the safety and full protection of the staff concerned, particularly during the hours of darkness. The temporary displacement of the loop cable over short distances will not cause a complete ATP failure, but a cable break will. Where welding has taken place, the loop cable will burn if it's replaced before the weld has cooled. You must take immediate action if you find damage to a beacon, loop cable or any part of the ATP installation. 
Report the matter to the signal fault control without delay. Any loop cables temporarily displaced by you or your colleagues during maintenance work must be correctly replaced immediately the job is finished. Take care not to trip over a beacon, especially in the dark. The loop cable can be a hazard as well, particularly where it's temporarily detached, like this. Don't stand on the beacons or the cable, and don't drop or place tools or equipment on them either. Automatic train protection is all about increasing the safety of our operations. The safety of our customers, the travelling public. This film has looked at how we, as track engineers, can carry out our duties while maintaining the ATP system and ensuring its efficiency at all times. Treat the ATP installation with the same care as you would the conventional signalling apparatus. ATP is a new and complex technology requiring the care and attention of all of us involved in it. Living with ATP is the key to its success and ours.